Author and psychedelic explorer Chris Bash meticulously documented the insights from 73 high-dose LSD sessions conducted over the course of 20 years, drawing upon his training as a philosopher of religion and following protocols established by Stanislav Grof. Chris went on a life-changing journey to explore his mind. What he discovered drew him into deep communion with cosmic consciousness. Chris Bash is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Youngstown State University, where he taught for 33 years. Chris is also adjunct faculty at California Institute of Integral Studies and a fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. An award-winning teacher, Chris work, Chris's work explores the philosophical implications of non-ordinary states of consciousness, especially psychedelic states. Chris has written four books, Life Cycles, A Study of Reincarnation in Light of Contemporary Consciousness Research, Dark Night, Early Dawn, A Pioneering Work in Psychedelic Philosophy and Collective Consciousness, and The Living Classroom, An Exploration of Teaching in Collective Fields of Consciousness, and his new book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, which I must say is, is absolutely brilliant and seems to be getting really good reception with everyone I know that's, that's reading it. It is a you, foam of, as you said, the, the deeper states that, that LSD gives us access to. It was a, quite an adventure, quite a long and uh, interesting journey. How long did it take you to write? Because there's obviously years of notes in there. Well, yeah, I had uh, years of notes in, all the, in the 20 years that I did the work. And then I digested that material for more years. And then I, I condensed my sessions, took notes and condensed them and got prepared. And once I actually started writing, it took five years. Okay. This so wow. was a long project. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it really highlights the importance um, of some type of integration. You being a writer, obviously that's your modality of integration. Mm -hmm. For others, it's art. For others, it's music. Um, but yeah. yeah, it really highlights the importance of finding a way of making sense of these experiences after the facts. And I remember yeah. uh, reading in the book that you would take the time to write as soon as possible after such an yeah. experience and to use the music that you had played during the sessions as a trigger, as a mimetic device to or a mnemonic device yeah. to, to bring yeah. back those emotions which can often get lost in the cloud of the intensity yeah. of it i guess yeah let me just mention something about the method just to give a context because that was an important aid in uh, solving a problem a challenging with work doing the work the way that i did what i did was to work after three medium dose sessions, always following Stan Groff's protocol. So I was always totally isolated, always working with the sitter, always working with eye shades and a music, totally internalized sessions. After three preliminary sessions, I did all the rest of the sessions, 73 sessions total, high dose sessions. So I was working at, essentially I aimed at 600 micrograms. So between 500 and 600 micrograms. So when you're working with doses that high and you're going as deep in serial sessions over many years, recall becomes a, a serious issue because mm -hmm. you're just pushing the boundaries of consciousness so deeply. So I found that um, to record the sessions, it was important to record them within 24 hours and recording them often had me writing at the very edges of my comprehension because I was trying to describe experiences that were deeply mysterious to me at the time. Mm. So I found it was a help if I listened to the music that was played in the session in exactly the order in which it was played. And I would play a piece of music over and over again while I was trying to record the session after the day after. And then when I was done with that section, I'd go on to the next piece of music all the way through. Wow. And that really, uh, you know, because the day after a session, you're kind of porous around the edges, but your mm. verbal functions are back. Mm. So you're in one foot in, one foot out. Mm. And I found by listening to the music, I could get into a, a state where I, I called it uh, standing at the edge of the well. 
where I would basically get back in the edge of it and enough that I could get it down on paper. Yeah, still a still a liminal stage. Um, yes, I remember. I remember you writing that some of the things you'd written down during the session it might have been like reality is, which at the time mm. can be so profound and meaningful. And you read it mm -hmm. back later and you. Well, of course it is. Of course the reality <laughs> yeah. is. And so it's obviously yeah. sifting through that stuff to 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 get yeah. the teams that can really yeah. be, be applied. And in general, general, I, I didn't try to make notes or record anything uh, during the session itself because I was so far removed that, uh, you know, I just I wasn't even in touch with my own body, let alone with anything going on in the room. Interesting, because that's that's yeah. something I've been thinking a bit about recently is, is recording sessions in the moment, particularly with 5-MeO DMT and, and toad medicine, because people seem to be channeling stuff, things are coming through, mm -hmm. languages and and mm -hmm. vocalizations that are that are quite simply out of this world, mm -hmm. which there is almost no way of recollecting afterwards. And so there does yeah. seem to be some merit in recording in the moments to, to capture yeah. things that might come through when your vessel is empty and, and essentially yeah. the universe is pouring like through. It may, be, it, may, it may vary by substance uh, and agenda. The, of course, the tricky part about the 5-AMEO experience is how uh, fast it is. Mm -hmm. It's short and it's incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. And a, the LSD experience is very, very long. It's, it's an eight-hour window. Uh, so it, each of them pose distinct challenges for recall and integration. Mm, mm. As, and as generally applicable across uh, all, all psychiatric medicines, I think they all have their own yeah. unique challenges. Um, yeah. So following Groff's protocol, what, I guess, the key question to begin with is what made you decide to do such large doses, given that that's generally yeah. a lot in his protocol? Yeah. Well, you know, in Stan's early work, he clearly differentiates between psycholytic or low dose therapy and psychedelic high dose therapy. And the protocol for psychedelic therapy was they developed this in Spring Grove Hospital and they were trying to trigger a near death episode experience with patients who were terminally ill. So, uh, and it was limited to three sessions. Uh, I thought, well, if you could go into high dose session space three times, you could do it more times. If you could do it safely three times, you could do it safely multiple times. And I guess in the beginning, I did high dose sessions simply because um, it was hard to find time to do sessions in a dual career marriage. And soon there were children involved just to get it in both of our schedules to get a day where we could give the entire day over to this work. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I was still thinking in terms of a personal model of therapeutic engagement. So all the Eastern sources that I had, you know, I'm a professor of religious studies, teach Eastern religion, psychology of religion. And these Eastern sources basically said your karma is ultimately finite over even with many lifetimes, your karma is finite. And I thought that I could just work through mine faster by working with high doses. I knew the sessions would be hard, but I thought if I could just stay grounded and stay focused and confronting the shadow, I could just work through my shadow faster that way. Yeah. Um, eventually that, that whole protocol was shattered when I began to realize that what was happening in my sessions went far beyond anything that concerned only my personal psyche and my personal karma, my personal soul. Right. But and even that, that after that the, point. Sorry, that would mm -hmm. be at the point of the ocean of suffering that you experienced where yeah, it was quite honestly up. hard to read that, that, that experience yeah. of the entire collective human pain throughout all of history. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard to read. I had to really give some careful thought of how much to expose that because I know it's challenging for readers to go into that material. Uh, but just to finish that other topic, even once I let go of that personal model, I found that I developed, I liked where the high dose work took me. 
Mm. And uh, it took me farther than I imagined, and I, I developed a taste for it. Now, I don't recommend this protocol. I really don't. I would do it differently if I were doing it over again today. I would be much gentler on myself. I would balance high dose work with low dose work. I would balance LSD with uh, psilocybin, ayahuasca, more organic psychedelics. But at the time, I mean, this was really, I started in 79. So I did this work between 79 and 99 when I was 30 to 50 years old. So at the time, um, well, I just, I ended up pushing myself harder than I would recommend other people to push themselves. It's really not necessary. I, I think also it has to cross in the book too, which is, is good. Yeah. 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 I thought that the goal was to get somewhere, you know, to get to some end point that would be enlightenment or oneness with God or the primal void. And I, I came to realize that that was a, a naive expectation. Uh, late, I mean, 50 sessions in, I had experiences which convinced me that the universe is infinite and uh, the divine is infinite. Well, it's not a matter of getting to the end or some ultimate state. It's a matter of opening ourselves as deeply as we can to the intelligence of the universe or to the intelligence of the divine, letting as much of it into us as possible and stabilizing it as deeply as possible. So you, you would have um, known that at least on a theoretical level from um, Eastern studies that, that enlightenment, you know, is, isn't a destination, it's, it's a journey. Um, mm -hmm. As cliche as that may sound. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you would have gone into, into the sessions with that at least in mind as a conceptual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I found even, uh, even the Eastern models that I was familiar with and working with uh, did not encapsulate or did not profile the full scale of the experiences that opened in this journey. Uh, because I found that, yes, you can work through multiple layers of the bardo, uh, the, inter the after death states, you can go into extra samsaric reality, into spiritual dimensions beyond the bardo. But whereas Buddhism particularly, which is kind of the, the Eastern traditions that I was most familiar with and most comfortable with, even that tradition sort of stops at that point and says, and invokes the grand silence. You know, when the Buddha was asked the ultimate questions, he invoked the grand silence. He wouldn't describe it. And I found that there were realities that would open at that dimension that were just, well, <laughs> so do you beyond. Think that grand silence um, is correlated with ineffability, which is often thrown about in the psychedelic world. Yeah particularly in relation to these large doses. Yeah. And I remember noting the concept of ineffability in the book. That yeah. Well, as I say in the book, I think ineffability is overrated mm. as, uh, as a category. I mean, it really comes from uh, William James in discussing this one of the qualities of, of mystical experience is ineffability. And um, I, of course, Ultimately, our rational mind and our verbal mind uh, fall silent when confronting the infinite. But I, I work very, very hard to put language to things. And uh, I believe in pushing language as far as humanly possible repeatedly before surrendering uh, to the ineffable. So, because if we, if we prioritize ineffability as one of the primary features of mystical experience, it almost is, is, is as if we're saying the divine wants to be uh, not known. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that the divine wants to be known. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ineffability, I think often is, um, it's a symptom of hitting our experiential limits. Uh, but if we, it, when we break into a new level of consciousness, we can't bring all of it back. There are gaps in my notes. So we just can't bring it all back. But I found that if you go back to that same level of consciousness again and again and again, 
experiences that were undigestible or unrecognizable or ineffable in the beginning become comprehensible with repetition and with experience. Uh, so to me, and it, if you can't say where you went, this is a little harsh, but if you can't say where you went, you probably just got lost. <laughs> I like that. And it reminds me of McKenna's saying about bringing back a middle-sized fish, you know, that, that mm -hmm. you have to bring something back for the community, you know. You've been yeah. living in the, in the realms of, of you know, yeah. extraordinary consciousness. You need yeah. to bring back something useful. Otherwise, what's it for? Unless you can I go. bring it back and articulate yeah. it and express yeah. it. And particularly for me, that's creative endeavors yeah. seem to have yeah. a, a real um, sort of purity about them. If, if you can create something beautiful, a painting or a sculpture that others can yeah. see and appreciate, it's one of the, uh, it's a true yeah. gift to be able to articulate the psychedelic experience in a creative manner. Yeah. And writing certainly falls into that category, yes. Yeah. And I found it just takes time. I mean, I've, I've really had to sit with my experience for years and years to understand them. In fact, as a general rule of thumb, I would never talk about an experience until five years after I'd had it uh, because it just takes a lot of time to fully digest and to understand. In fact, I had the narrative, I had recorded my experiences all the way through, but I was still learning things about the journey in the process of writing the entire journey down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that too. When you start to write things down, other things fall in. It's almost oh. like it creates a space for yeah. those perhaps otherwise forgotten aspects yeah. to, to, to drop back in. And um, yeah. there's even um, aspects of the sh Amazonian shamanic tradition that, that say you shouldn't speak, like sharing circles are, are not a thing yeah. simply because you, by sharing your experience the next morning, it dilutes it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had to really, in Buddhism, uh, also, one does not speak about one's spiritual experiences except to one's teacher. And I had to sit with that for a long time because Buddhism is, you know, an important tradition for me, as all the tradition, spiritual traditions are, but particularly Buddhism. And I really had to ponder whether I should even be talking about these experiences. But in the end... Uh, my experience was that the universe wanted me to share what it was that she or it had allowed me to experience. I didn't, I didn't program my experiences. I didn't choose what I experienced. Something else was entirely in control of my experiences through the entire journey. And at the end, you know, um, the universe made it clear that she said, you didn't give yourself those experiences. We gave you those experiences. Those experiences were never meant for you by yourself. They were always meant for you to share with others. And I think we, it's basically no one person's experiences are really important. But when all of our experiences are shared together in the circle, then we begin to have a deeper understanding of this mysterious universe that we're exploring. Yeah, it can build a, a cultural picture that, that then yeah. uh, has a context for it. Um, yeah. yeah. Just to go back with what you said earlier about um, if you were to do it again differently, that you would use different plants almost like, and you know, different compounds almost like uh, building a house. You use different tools for different uh, parts of the construction. Um, yeah. Do you work with other plants now? Um, or did you end your experiences at that 73 high dose positions? If that's not uh, much personal questions. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, no, I still use medicines from time to time, though much less than I used to. I mean, somewhat it's a, a young man's game, a young person's game. I'm 70 years old now. Yeah. So if I haven't well, learned it by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, after I stopped my work, the LSD work in 99, and after that, from time to time, I would do light sessions or I would do psilocybin sessions and a few times ayahuasca sessions or salvia divinorum. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, broadened my experience by working with those substances. But the, the LSD work was in a category 
unto itself. Mm. Uh, and, and I found one of the things I found was that um, my body, my system was storing energy uh, over time. So when I was doing multiple sessions, my system was storing energy of those sessions and then using that stored energy periodically to trigger breakthroughs into new levels of consciousness. So that I, if I were to even take a massive dose of LSD today, I would not be able to get back to where I was working regularly when I finished my work in 99. It would take years for me to develop the, the, the energy, the power to be able to access those deeper dimensions of, of the universe. My understanding over time that developed was every step into a deeper level of consciousness is a step into a higher energy, a higher yes. energetic yeah, state. That really stood out that line. Yeah. 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 And well, it just takes a long time to develop the power to access these very, very highly energized states of, of consciousness. And I think that's um, working with, with integration, particularly with 5MEO, I noticed there's a lot of people can be quite um, depersonalized, disassociated after a very high dose mm -hmm. toad session. Yeah. And one of the things we advise is embodiment is to bring that energy back into the body and to ground it through the earth. Yeah. Um, you know, not to go into meditation, yeah. which is going to get you more into the ethereal realms to bring it back in, into the earthly realm, almost to discharge it. It's like yeah. your body becomes a capacitor for, for this energy. Yeah. After it's been an empty vessel to, to, yeah. to accept it. it. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. I think that was a good, good point to um, jump into the three other two phases you spoke about. Mm -hmm. uh, the cleansing and the ecstatic phase. Yeah, basically working the way I did, I found that my sessions basically had two phases. The, at the beginning of every phase, there was some type of intense cleansing or purification process. And if you surrender to that, if I surrender to that completely, that would eventually come hit a peak threshold. And then there would be some type of death rebirth process and then the rest of the session was spent in an ecstatic state in some type of transcendent experience of some form or another and that process kept repeating itself over and over uh, through the years you know you think that's so down to the nature of the compound itself that's just the way LSD works is it a, a sort of turnaround point halfway at those doses no I don't think so. I think we're looking at, it's one of the dynamics of consciousness, that when you are opening to deeper levels of consciousness, these deeper levels of consciousness require a, just to enter them triggers a purification, a spontaneous purification of your, of your system, uh, purification of your thoughts, of your emotions, purification of your body. Uh, and so just when you're, when you're entering into these very, very intense, very, very pure states of consciousness, you just start a spontaneous detoxification process. And there's so many c concepts and belief systems and emotional complexes that we all carry that have to be taken apart, have to be undone if we're going to experience the universe at that deeper level. Mm. So I've certainly noticed this, on ayahuasca is, and, and obviously the, the, yeah. the purge is, is very much associated with ayahuasca, but as you point out, it, it, it's applicable yeah. to all psychedelic medicines in which you need to remove the blockages in your own system, be they psychological, yeah. emotional, energetic, before you can open yeah. up and then be open to those yeah. levels. And so you, yeah, you some extrapolated three factors from those two phases too. Mm, refresh me what um, which particular ones are you plugging into there so there's a, the ex cleansing and ecstatic phase with a sliding mm -hmm. line between two functions of, of the larger whole which was yeah. influenced by three factors that related to each uh planetary setting um yeah, yeah and the and then first the the depth of the ecstatic portion of the session, 
would be was influenced by several factors as I came to understand it. One of them was the depth of cleansing that had taken place in the first part of the session. So usually the deeper the cleansing, the deeper the ecstatic revelation, ecstatic entry. The second one was the depth of cleansing that had taken place in all of the sessions up to that point in time. So naturally I say in the book, you expect a deeper experience 50 sessions into a journey than on the first couple of sessions into a journey. And the third has to do with this energy quality, the quality of the, the massive amounts of energy that's involved. So when you work in serial sessions, and I was doing on average about five sessions a year. So I, I worked for four years, I stopped for six years, and then I worked for 10 years. And on average, I was doing about five a year. So when you're working systematically like that, you're taking your body and your mind into those states, it, you build up this energetic momentum. It's like an athlete in training. You know, the more you train, you build up this, this energy, which then carries you through uh, new um, performance levels. And I think that happens with the universe too. It just, it carries you into deeper levels of consciousness. I found that I, because these sessions were so intense and they were so demanding psychologically and demanding physically, uh, I really had to prepare myself for days before every session, physically, yoga wise, chiropractic wise, making sure my body was carefully aligned. Um, and then spiritually, uh, dietarily, spiritually, uh, I would, there were certain practices that I would do before a session and other practices that I would do to integrate the session afterwards. So, yeah, because it's just so extremely intense. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting you used the term breadth there as well. Not only depth, but breadth, like width, mm -hmm. um, like a bandwidth, yeah. uh, which is the yeah. yeah, first time I've heard it sort of referred to that way. Yeah, well, I, in certain specific experiences, the, the breath hest is a, is a metaphor that describes the ways in which we connect with humanity, we connect with other persons, we connect with nature, we can enter into states of consciousness that are extremely wide, so to speak. Depth is something different. Depth is entering into contact with deeper levels of reality, other systems of reality, other beings, archetypal reality, um, void, the pure void, cosmic void types of reality. Those are different different categories of experience mm. okay that might be a good point to talk about archetypes hmm well let me just kind of lay out some of the sequences the the, the categories and when i when i got to the end of the journey uh well i went through what i experienced as a series of punctuated death and rebirth experiences so i would break into a new level of consciousness I would then stabilize at that level over multiple sessions and I'd become more familiar with that level and I'd get to understand it more and become more familiar cognitively how it works and energetically would be purified by the process of engaging that level of consciousness. And then over time, if I kept pushing, I would come to a, a threshold and I would go through another death and rebirth process and that would drive me into yet another level of reality. And it would start all over again, mm -hmm. having to stabilize my consciousness at that level, having to learn how to manage the, the factors at level. So when I got to the end of the journey and I was looking back, I asked myself, well, how many levels of consciousness did I enter? How many fundamental core platforms did I go through? And I basically boiled them down to five. So there was a level of work at the personal level of consciousness. And then there was a level of work at the collective level of collective mind, which is where the, the, you know, the ocean of suffering work and where the purification was really aimed at the purification of the collective psyche more than the personal psyche. And after that, there was the archetypal dimension of consciousness entering into archetypal consciousness and then entering into oneness or causal consciousness 
and then entering finally into what I call the diamond luminosity, which is what Buddhism would call Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality. Uh, so for me, after I went through death and rebirth at a personal level, and then after I went through, that took about two years, and then after two years of work at the collective level, working at the, uh, in the purification part, working in the ocean of suffering work, and then experiencing successive deeper initiations into the universe in a chapter that I call initiation of the universe. Then I was spun into archetypal reality. Uh, my experience was when I entered archetypal reality, I had the extraordinary sensation that I was entering a level of reality that was more real than time and space was. It was more real than our lives here was. And mm -hmm. it, it took me a long time, you know, several sessions to stabilize and to be able to enter that level of reality. And the nature of death that was required to enter that reality was different than ego death. I had to literally die as a human being in order to enter archetypal reality. So I found that there was a level of identity that we all have as human beings, it's our, it's our humanness, it's our human identity that's deeper than our personal identity. And the human identity had to die in order to function at a level of consciousness that allowed me to have access to levels of reality beyond human consciousness, beyond the collective psyche, beyond the, and entering into archetypal reality. And there I basically, I only spent about a year and a half at that level. I mean, it, which is not much time. It's just the tip of the iceberg in a way. But I experienced sort of two levels of archetypal reality. One which you might think of as a more of a platonic level. I encountered beings, phenomena that were vast. I mean, they were just huge. I could not wrap my mind around them. I mean, I just they were just staggering. They, are the, they were the forces of nature that were responsible for creating time and space and for orchestrating the events that were taking place in time and space. And then at a, a lower level of consciousness, what I would call a, a Jungian level of consciousness, I entered into repeated experiences of experiencing the the psyche of the human species or the, the literally the collective unconscious how how the system works that the human species lives as a single entity psychologically even physically that our minds are cells within our, our collective mind and our bodies are cells within the collective body of humanity i learned that our healing of our individual diseases contributes to a healing of those conditions within the body of humanity as a whole. So it was just over and over again being taken into um, the dynamics of wholeness, the wholeness of our species. And I think these, these experiences, which were always there, it was like I was being educated one after another, first stabilizing at this level, going to another level, going to another level. And I think these experiences were teaching me what I needed to know in order to receive the visions that came later uh, on where humanity is going, the birth of the future human, the crisis that we're coming to in history, what that's all about. That's great. Yeah, I think what that really shows too is the fractal nature of, of yes. all of it, of, of reality. Um, the way yeah. you describe the different levels as being parts of the whole. And it's interesting you mentioned entities because it's something that we tend to associate with DMT more than anything, mm -hmm. even though we know mm -hmm. from those experiences that, yes, you have to die and you know, the, there has yeah. to be the death of the self in order to open up to those, those larger realms. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to acknowledge there because I just noticed in my notes, um, Kalindi E, were you aware of his work? I'm sorry, say again? Were you, were you aware of Kalindi E? Um, no, I wasn't. An who, who was a large advocate for 30 grams of dried mushrooms plus. And mm. so he was entering some very, very deep realms of, of psilocybin. Mm -hmm. he, he passed recently. Mm. 
um, last week. I, I just started my notes and then thought I should mm-hmm. acknowledge it there before I before I forgot. Um, no, I'm afraid not. Now, did you have a teacher during all of this? Um, you you mean a practice, a, a spiritual teacher, yes. or well, no, I consider the universe my only teacher. You see, one of the things that um, maybe is a little unusual about my experiences compared to other people I've talked to is that I didn't have a lot of contact with individual beings, which are so common in the DMT experience. Uh, and I, over time, I've really pondered why that was the case. And basically, I kept being dissolved into levels of being and then being dissolved into deeper levels of being and kind of opening up into vast expanses of consciousness and vast dimensions of and learning how the universe works, but not in a way which engaged involved engaging individual beings who live on those levels. And about the closest I could come to encountering beings as such like that is when I described archetypal reality. But these these realities were so large, I the best my mind could do to image them was to image them as galaxies. I saw them as galaxies, billions and billions of light years wide. They were so foreign. But in general, I mean, I, I have had contact with beings, with psilocybin or with mm-hmm. ayahuasca, mm-hmm. things like that. But the LSD work just kept dissolving me into deeper and deeper into being itself so that there was always, I would encounter an intelligence and an intelligence would guide me and orchestrate and teach me and talk to me. And it was an ever deepening, cascading deepening of this intelligence. But I, I never had the sense of encountering or experiencing discrete intelligences. Mm -hmm. So to me, uh, the universe is a, is an infinite potential. And uh, I experience a dialogue or rapport or dissolving into deeper and deeper and deeper layers of this infinite ocean. And so I consider, I mean, I consider the universe my teacher and the universe was always there articulately at the other end, but the nature of the intelligence that I was encountering kept changing, kept deepening as it went, as it took me deeper. So it's, I think it's that's a little different. I think that's a lot um, about LSD itself um, in relation to the other compounds. I think that there is a kind of resonance between the form of the substance or compounds or plants and the experience. Um, Mm -hmm. To me, LSD has always been a very human centric experience Mm. um, from, you know, the the therapeutic levels of the individual self and and the cleansing right through to our place in the the largest cosmos we can imagine. But, but as, as you noted, it's not about sort of beings from other realms or other realities or, or other dimensions. Mm-hmm. It seems to be very grounded in the human psyche and what it's infinitely capable of. And yeah. I don't know, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, whether that has anything to do with the synthetic nature of it being, you know, um, discovered by Hoffman in a laboratory as opposed to occurring in the the deep jungles or Australian bush. Yeah. Well, you know, people, a lot of people have a lot of convictions around the difference between synthetic psychedelics and organic psychedelics. Yeah. And I don't really have a big investment in that distinction. Uh, I don't have enough data points to really draw a lot of conclusions, but I I would do have this observation. Um, Substances, the longer humanity has worked with a substance, I think there are energetic fields like Rupert Sheldrake's morphogenetic fields that develop around a substance. So when people have the experience of encountering 
the ayahuasca deity or the psilocybin deity. I, I, I can't help but think that in some ways, the substance, the experience we have with psilocybin or with ayahuasca, which humanity has been using for thousands of thousands of years, that there's a certain way in which all of humanity's experiences with this substance create a field surrounding this chemical. So when I take this chemical, it's not just putting the chemical into my body. In some sense, I am opening myself to the field of humanity's experience with this substance. Uh, LSD is a basically a new substance. It's, you know, it's only a few decades old, and the 60s and 70s is nothing compared to the length of time that uh, human beings have been using ayahuasca. So I have always experienced LSD to be a very clean substance in that respect, without a lot of cultural baggage around it, using it the way that I did. And to me, it just, it just shatters me. It dissolves my consciousness over and over and over again at deeper and deeper levels and takes me into territory which felt kind of from an evolutionary perspective it felt fresh. It, it, there were places that I went that did not feel like there were many f- footprints on them from other human beings. And I don't have that experience when I've worked with psilocybin or with ayahuasca, where the, those territory feel more uh, frequently traveled, so to speak. Well, it's interesting that you also note the experience of perceiving the universe as feminine. Yeah, uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, two reasons that I talk about in the book. The first reason is simply because of the tremendous love that the experience of the universe triggered in me and just awoke within me and the deep heartfelt opening and the, the depth of, com- of passion that I felt for the universe that was taking me in. That love, which for me had a feminine quality to it. Uh, But the other reason was uh, because of the specific cosmology that emerged in my sessions. And this cosmology surprised me. It wasn't one that I had internalized or taken in from any of the sources that I had read. And the cosmology basically, there was an experience, a series of experiences that took me back to the beginning of creation, back before the Big Bang. And I experienced the universe as basically emerging out of this primal oneness, which, you know, the the oneness becomes the two, yin-yang. And the experience was that (laughs) out of that primal two, one of those consciousness stayed outside of time and space and stayed intact, and the other consciousness began a journey of manifesting time and space and manifesting everything that has evolved in time and space since the Big Bang. And so the, the consciousness that stayed outside of the entire evolutionary or creation project felt more to me, felt more, quote, masculine. And the consciousness which created felt more feminine so that it's, felt congruent with me to, in, to I, had, I just had repeatedly the experience of the universe itself as more feminine than masculine. And uh, I mean, I just has that quality to me. Mm-hmm. So the great mother lineage is very strong in me. I've always understood myself to be deeply connected to the great mother lineage. Um, and it's you know, I consider... Yeah in many cultures around the world, as, as you would know. Yeah, um, yes. The of the earth being the, the great mother. Um, yeah, around indigenous yeah. I consider my work always in service of the great mother. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, as, as I noted earlier, um, I got to, uh, I'm just up to the point of deep time in your book. Mm. Um, yeah. Perhaps you could uh, give us a little insight into the nature of deep time. Yeah. And then... Well, early on in my work, when I entered into the ocean of suffering during the cleansing part, is really, really intense collective cleansing. 
when I would come through each session, I would be spun into a reality that was so foreign to me that in the beginning, I, I came back from the, my 11th session and I couldn't remember it. I mean, I, re, I couldn't remember where I had gone. It took me months to begin to fully remember it. And what had happened is I entered what I later came to call deep time. For a year, in seven, a total of seven sessions, I experienced my life as a completed whole, start to finish, all the days of my life as a simultaneously present now. And uh, I experienced the totality of my life, beginning to end. Uh, that, that was so hard for my mind to hold on to because my mind is trained to operate within linear conditions where time flows one moment at a time but to experience all of the moments of my life as a simultaneous present, it took literally, it took me an entire year to learn how to stabilize consciousness at that condition. I kept going back and back and back into the same condition. So the universe was teaching me how to be conscious at that condition, in that condition. Later, I began to enter more radical dimensions of time. I entered not personal deep time, I entered evolutionary deep time. I had experiences of, it wasn't eternity, it wasn't timelessness, that's a different experience. It was different swaths of time, it was, I would experience different patterns within time on a scale of a hundred thousand years or within a scale of a million years uh, either simultaneously present or in an accelerated fashion so I would I could ex sometimes I would experience centuries going by in seconds but I was experiencing life in terms of the rising and falling of way of of, of some generations, just generations coming and going, generations after generations, in order to ex understand or to be taught what was happening underneath the evolutionary dance. So I just experienced so many variations on time that I, I came to call it deep time. Dif the deep time is entering into a different modality of time consciousness. I, I do think that... Uh, there, in the universe, there are multiple envelopes of time, multiple modalities of time. Linear time is how the world behaves inside time space. But as you move to the edges of space, you move to the edges of time. And there, between linear time and timelessness, where you're outside of time altogether, in that intermediate domain, there are multiple modalities of time. Uh, and you can learn to stabilize consciousness at those levels of time. And it seemed that the universe wanted to teach me certain things. And the only way it could teach me certain things was to teach me how to, to stay conscious in these unusual temporal modalities. In fact, the, the last of the, what I consider the great visions, the last of the great visions took place in the 70th session. And it was one of the most extreme strip downs that I went through in any of my sessions. And it moved me into the most radical uh, experience of deep time in all of my sessions. In fact, after this vision, the universe basically wrapped it up. The next three sessions, it kind of wrapped up our work together. This was the dominant vision. And it took me far, far into the deep future, into humanity's evolutionary future. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was just going to ask you what that that um, window of deep time into the evolution of the human species. What what insights that gave you about yeah. our future direction? Yeah. Well, starting at around the twenty third session and repeating itself in a punctuated way over the years, uh, the universe kept on taking me into. Uh, giving me teachings about the human story. It, it was basically giving me the outline of you, what you might call the master story. And I, I apologize for the, 
arrogance of that concept. I, I don't mean it as such, but it just kept taking me over and over again, showing me certain things about humanity. It kept emphasizing that we were coming to a crescendo in our evolutionary journey. We were coming to a turning point, a true before and after point. And we, after thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of struggle, and, and of course, with reincarnation, I believe in reincarnation. My first book was on reincarnation. I've had lots of experiences around reincarnation. So when I talk about humanity evolving for 100,000 years, I'm this within a reincarnational framework, not just a genetic, but a reincarnational development. Uh, it kept emphasizing that humanity was growing, coming to a turning point in its larger evolutionary story. And it was a turning point that was so decisive that we would mark history in terms of the before and after of this point. Yeah. Uh, and then in the 55th session, it, it took me, it, hmm. it kept showing me that there was a, uh, a profound opening that was in the process of emerging in the human heart, a profound change in the human psyche that was taking place in history. Uh, but it, it didn't show me how it was going to accomplish this. It, could, it never showed me how until the 55th session. And at that session, it took me deep into the future, deep into deep time. And it took me into the death and rebirth of our species. It literally gave me an experience, not as Chris Bache, but by this time, the boundaries of Chris Bache had been shattered so many times in so many ways. It took me into how the species as a whole was going to experience this death and rebirth. So that just as individuals go through death and rebirths and a, a mystic goes through the dark night of the soul and then the birth into spiritual reality, the entire human species was going to go through a death and rebirth process. And it, it, it gave me that experience where we, it just, it, we went through a series. This is a process that takes generations to actualize, but a process where we, it got so bad where there was a falling apart, a loss of control, a, uh, an unraveling of the assumptions that we make in life. It would just broke us down, just like in a psychedelic session, when you die and are reborn, the entire species was going through a loss of control, a breakdown. And just when it looked like we would all be dead, just when it looked like we were coming to a, an extinction event, the worst of it passed, and we began to emerge and pick ourselves up and go forward. And when we emerged, a different humanity was in its place. Something happened in this death rebirth process, in this collective birth, death rebirth process. So we were changed profoundly, a tremendous opening of the heart, an opening of the mind, so that the humans that were coming out of the other end, this was a shift that took place in the depths of the collective psyche. It wasn't taking place at the surface of the individual psyche. This is a pivot at the core of the collective unconscious. And when this pivot takes place, all, other, all subsequent human beings will be born within the contracts or the matrix of this changed collective psyche. And it, it really was literally, I think, uh, an enlightenment of our entire species, a death and rebirth and a spiritual opening of our entire species. Later, I came to understand this in terms of what I call the birth of the diamond soul. Um, my understanding of reincarnation is when we die, our consciousness expands into deep spiritual reality. Uh, and when we're born, we get small. We become male, female, this, that, you know. And then when we ex die, we get big. When we're born, we get small. It's like going to college. It's like when you go to college, you choose specific courses for the semester. That's your semester's work. Then at the end of the semester, you go on spring break, summertime, then you get back small again. So you just over and over, 
over and over. We get big, we get small, we get big and we get small. And if we keep this up for a few hundred thousand years, sooner or later, the large consciousness, which is the consciousness of the soul, the consciousness that holds all of our experiences for all of our lifetimes, that consciousness, which we naturally return to when we die in the bardo condition, that consciousness, I think, awakens inside time and space. And this is what I call the birth of the diamond soul. We literally wake up to our entire identity and our entire history inside time and space so that we're no longer even tempted to think that our present body and the little bitty consciousness of ego is our true identity. The soul wakes up on earth. And I think that's what's happening for the entire human race. The crises that we're experiencing and we're moving into with the global systems crisis and the, the global ecological crisis, mm. we're, we're experiencing the ending of a world that was built by the ego. And the ego is a magnificent, like a magnificent phenomenon, but yeah, ultimately cool. it's, it's cut off from each other. It's cut off from itself. It's cut off from the other beings. The culture that we're living in is a culture that was built by the ego. And in order to solve the problems which we are confronting in this generation, this century, we have to transcend egoic consciousness. We, we can't solve these problems at the level of egoic consciousness. And I think there's a tremendous evolutionary drive for us to give, to wake up to our soul, to that soul reality, and literally give birth to soul consciousness inside time and space. And if we can imagine what it would be like to have an entire species that is awake to their soul reality. Yeah. Now we're talking about a turning point yeah. in history. And that's what I think is happening. I think we're entering a process of labor. Uh, uh, and labor is a, you know, a gestation lasts a long time. Labor is fast and short. A very, very intense, very, very painful day. Humanity has been gestating, developing the capacity of soul for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I think we are entering labor now. This tremendous unraveling, this tremendous pain of history that we are entering and will continue to enter for decades still is not an end, an apocalypse. It's not an end of existence, an end of life, but it's giving birth to the future human. And I think the future human is the diamond soul. Yeah. The well, soul. Well, well, apocalypse is, is revelation. It's to lift the veil and, and to reveal the hidden, the unseen, the new. So you yeah. get the feeling that this time is now, that this rebirth takes place. I mean, when we look out at what's going on at the moment, it certainly mm -hmm. feels like a dramatic yeah. catharsis is taking place. And yeah. we either go, it's like the forces of freedom and control are, are dominating the battle. And we can either go in, in two directions, you know, uh, yeah. in increasing yeah. control and totalitarianism or increasing freedom and autonomy and, and sovereignty. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting because I wonder how much of that is a sort of a, a, a grand narrative collective story in the spiritual world that because I, I hear it a lot from many different circles that you know we are um birthing into the new age into the new man um yeah and and yeah, yeah and that would be absolutely beautiful if that was the the case and it indeed is the case that that yeah. this is the the um the painful birth that we need to go through in order to transition into a, a better, more functional, more balanced uh, species. Yeah. Um, so you and have, so yeah, mm -hmm. let me elaborate on that. Well, there's a chapter in the book called The Birth of the Future Human. And I discuss this in a chapter called The Great Awakening in Dark Night, Early Dawn, this book that I wrote in, in, uh, uh, in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, and I go into it deeper in, uh, LSD in the mind of the universe and the birth of the future human. And I was first very uncomfortable going into this territory because I'm not comfortable with what some would call his 
think of as historical speculation. And I had begun this work really thinking in terms, I was doing this work for my individual healing, my individual transformation, my individual enlightenment. And that just got blown away, you know, within a few years and everything everything, the work, the purification, the accessing, the information, the knowledge, everything seemed to be in service of the species as a whole. That's, it's like, that's what the divine is really interested in right now. Not that our species is special in the universe, but, and, but the scale of what the divine is focused in on this planet is species-wide. It's not so much individual, it's species-wide. And so, uh, this was repeated so many times and so strongly that the entire gist of my 20-year journey ended up being focused on this collective story of death and rebirth. So, every, I mean, I have deep convictions about, I think we've entered the dark night of our collective soul. We've entered the dark night, which is a period of purification. We basically are confronting in a very accelerated manner uh, the sins of the past. We would say the sins of our fathers, except we were our fathers. We are our mothers, you know, so reincarnational wise, we're confronting our history. We're confronting the choices that we've made and the consequences of those choices. And we are purifying ourselves of the toxins left over by those choices in order to open ourselves up into uh, new dimensions of our being. Because when we, when we open to our soul, it opens, it has a, two uh, immediate effects, an enormous expansion of compassion because we, we have relationships. I mean, we haven't met each before, right? <laughs> you and I are new to each other, but yeah. how many times has your soul and my soul, you know, in different times in history made contact and the people that we have, our friends and our enemies, and we have such a, a deep, deep history on this planet. So when, when you wake up as a soul, in a sense, you wake up to that history and it has the effect of unleashing an enormous compassion for not only human beings, but all being, for all life forms. And then there is, when you wake up to that kind of depth, it also opens up a deeper experience of communion with cosmic intelligence because it's like the ego is operating under a cloud of, of uh, obstruction. But when the soul awakens, then it's easier to enter into conscious rapport with the consciousness of the universe itself. So there is literally an awakening to, trans to transcendent consciousness, as well as an awakening to tremendous breadth of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's where I think we're heading. Yeah, and I think you're, you're um your description in the ocean of suffering of experiencing the pain of every woman that had every, that had ever existed exemplifies that, that when you experience empathetically, emotionally, yeah. um, with all the beings yeah. that you have been in this model of reincarnation, then it by extent has to lead to something larger. It has to, you know, resolve into a, a higher level. Um, higher level. So when did yeah. you when did you write um, Dark Knight Early Dawn in relation to to this book? Yeah. I wrote Dark Knight Early Dawn. Uh, I wrote it in ninety five, ninety six. Okay. I stopped my work in ninety nine when I had already entered the Diamond Luminosity years. The last five years of my work were centered on what I call the Diamond Luminosity work. But I deliberately, when I wrote Dark Night Early Dawn, I deliberately restricted myself for the most part to analyzing only the sessions that emerged in the first half of my journey. I did not discuss what was happening in the second half. I, 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 I needed more time to digest them. So in Elysee in the Mind of the Universe, I go back to the very beginning. The whole structure of the book is just start in the first session take it all the way through every chapter deals with a certain number of sessions, just do it layer by layer. This is where it started. This is where it went. This is where it ended. So dark night early dawn was written basically about three quarters of the way through the journey itself. 
Okay, that's interesting because I, I had not read it. And so I asked one of our team members, Andre, to just throw some questions mm-hmm. out about um, that book, which, which he had read. And mm-hmm. um, he, he asked, mm-hmm. he gave me a few actually. Um, one that stands out to me here is, um, as a teacher of comparative religion, your take on the problem of theodicy, the, the problem of reconciling a beneficent intelligence with the radical examples of evil in history yeah. in the present day, is, is there a yeah. solution to the, to the destructive phenotype within human yeah. mind? The, the problem of suffering, and, mm. or some people would say the problem of evil, I don't use that category because that's just a theological interpretation of the, of the experience of suffering and pain. Mm. Uh, you know, I think Ramakrishna was right. Ramakrishna said, if you want to understand God, you must be willing to look suffering in the face because suffering doesn't come from any secondary source. Mm. It's not a demonic you know, agency that you have to, you have to look deeply into the logic of the universe and the, the logic of creation. If you want to understand how to reconcile the intelligence of the universe and the compassion of the universe with the fact that existence hurts so much. There's so much pain and suffering here. And I think the key is understanding that creation or evolution or the manifestation of life, we are very, it's incomplete. We're not finished. We are, we're building something. And, uh, and, the what we are building is something which is evolving and developing over billions and billions of years. So the universe as we find it now and as we measure it in the last 10,000 years, say, is just a drop in the bucket compared to the billions of years that preceded it and the billions of years that come after it. So it's clearly there's a great deal of pain and suffering in life as we experience in its current form, but we are evolving and developing and becoming more consciousness. We're learning from our choices. We're getting more and more control over our bodies and our mind. And we're going to keep this up, not for another couple of decades or a few more hundred years, or even a few thousand years. We're going for millions and millions and billions and billions of years. So, to me, suffering, the, the, the scale of suffering has to be understood, or the, the logic of suffering has to be understood, not necessarily in terms of just what has been accomplished up to now, but we have to understand that we are in a process, we are in a developmental process, and it's an incomplete process. And so it's, it's kind of like when you're building a house, and you just have the stud walls up, and you have the trusses up, but you don't have the roof on. And the rain comes and it gets wet because there's no roof because you haven't built the roof yet. But humanity hasn't achieved levels of capacity that would allow us to stop the suffering. And it's, and it's not because we're bad and it's not because we're being forced or manipulated by dark and demonic forces. It's just a radically incomplete process. We're trying to continue the process as fast as we can. Now, do you, do you believe within the sort of the model of yin and yang of there being perfect balance and dual forces throughout the universe that, that suffering is balanced equally by pleasure and, and good in the world that for every, you know, starving child experiencing the pain of hunger, there is a, a person experiencing the beauty of a sunset. Do you think it exists in that kind of balance? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so because that would mean if in a long-term wise, if we were ever going to continue or deepen our joy, we would be deepening and continuing our suffering. And I don't think that's where we're going necessarily. Uh, I think we are, <laughs> you know, I ask my classes sometimes when I was teaching, if I draw a line on the board, and the evolutionary line. And so I would ask, how far are we on the evolutionary line? Are we like 90% along this line? Well, 
And if you are 90% along the line, then we have a certain set of conclusions that would seem to follow when we look at life and try to understand it. But what if we're only 1%? on this line? Yeah, yeah. What if everything that we've developed is really just a little bitty, bitty bit of this entire process? Then that opens up the picture enormously. We, up until just a few decades ago, a few hundred years ago, I mean, yeah, it opens up hope. We used to think the universe was 6,000 years old <laughs> because we added up all the ages of everybody in the Bible. <laughs> Yeah, now we understand it's billions and billions of years old just since this first big bang. And we don't know whether they had been bangs before. If it's an expanding and contracting universe, it may have been, there may have been other universes that feed into the intelligence of this manifestation of this universe. So the challenge here is to, is to engage and comprehend the scale of the project that we are involved in. It, or to put it a different way, if you want to speak within divine terms, or is to understand the scale of the agenda of the divine. It's like we're, we're literally just children. We only became self-conscious a few thousand years ago. We only dropped beneath the level of our individual consciousness to discover the dimensions of our mind, which are universal, oh, maybe four or 5,000 years ago. We're just beginning to wake up on this planet. And this planet has been four and a half billion years in the making, 13.7 billion years in the gal galactic scale of things. And we're just waking up. We're just getting started here. And so it's not surprising from that perspective. And of course, suffering is the great, great challenge. I mean, as you say, the children who are dying, the children who are suffering from hunger, uh, the injustices that, that surround us completely. I'm not making light of any of those things in, in saying this. We have to address those things. We have to expand and continue to work on those things. But philosophically, we have to sort of understand that we're just beginning to wake up to the scale of the universe that gave birth to us and is continuing to give birth to us. From that perspective, we have a lot of work to do, but we have a lot of hope. I really do think we're, we're becoming a species of Christ, a species of Buddhas, a species of the prophet. We are becoming a, an entirely higher order of species over time. And this is gonna be what we're doing is extraordinarily important this time in history, but very, very hard work. But when we go through this process, when we give birth to the future human, like a mother who gives birth to a child, when she holds her child, she doesn't forget the pain, but she knows that the pain was worth it in order to deliver this child. And when we give birth to the future human, we will look back at all of the suffering of all of history and we will say it was worth it for where we are and where we're going. So, so if I'm to read you the balance, the balance of yin and yang and, and pain and joy is laid out on this scale of deep time, which, which I recall you, you referring to uh, bhakti in relation to that. Uh, the concept of you know loving devotion mm -hmm. and you know re, um, yeah. leaving all beings of pain and suffering. Yeah, well, you know, yin yang. I, I, yin yang is is a, a an attempt by a particular culture to articulate some of the deep structure of the universe and to point to this primal duality which then divides into the 10,000 things, becomes the 10,000 things, the complexity of the evolving of life. But I don't think, I think we have to be careful not to hang too much on the, the primary polarity, good, bad, male, female, things like this. Uh, but the bhakti is a different issue. And, and this was a surprise to me. You know, in Hinduism, there are four systems of spiritual work, four yogas. Uh, this yana yoga, uh, the, the yoga of meditation, karma yoga, the yoga of action, uh, uh, blanking on Panama. Bhakti is the, is the yoga of emotion. It's loving God. It's becoming awakened through love. Uh, I had always 
been attracted to more of the mental forms of spiritual practice. I, of all the various yogas in Hinduism, I was least attracted to bhakti, the emotions, the cultivation of the emotional relationship with the divine. And yet I found in the psychedelic work, uh, uh, bhakti was activated. Bhakti was very powerfully activated so that I had not only a mental relationship with the universe and a cognitive experience of the universe, but an overwhelmingly powerful emotional connection to the universe and experience of the universe so that it, it just, it became a love relationship. And that's why for me, I mean, everybody has to develop their own vocabulary for the ultimate reality. Uh, but my vocabulary for ultimate reality, I call the absolute, my beloved, the beloved, just because it, that's the bhakti quality. Uh, yeah, it I've, just touches I've, my heart. Yeah, I've noticed that with with five meo, when when everything is stripped away and there is that yeah. uh, zero point singularity, that everything is fused into one point. The only thing left is love. Yeah. The only thing that can exist, or the only thing left to exist, is this yeah. universal love, and it's it's. Yeah. Quite interesting. I mean, I guess from a re neuroreductionist perspective, you could say that's because your serotonin receptors have been completely flooded. Um, yeah. But so still, experientially, me, love, it's love. Love is the qual is the um, the experiential quality of oneness. Oneness and love are two different sides of the same coin. Because when you dissolve into oneness, then instantly love is the experience that the universe has for itself there is no division in oneness so mm -hmm. oneness is all embracing so we might experience this as compassion or love but the logic of love is the logic of oneness everything short of oneness is, is fragmented okay so would you agree with this perspective that that i see a lot in the psychedelic community that the, the universe create separation in order to experience itself in order to experience the you know the joy and the pain because one no. cannot experience itself alone yeah <laughs> it's you know that it really presses the question i mean when we're asking the question why existence why is there anything when, when there was the primal void, when, let's say, to use God language, when the divine was whole and complete and perfect equanimity within itself, why did it manifest the universe knowing what would be involved, knowing all the pain and suffering that was involved? What was that about? And uh, one of the proposals is, well, this is a way of the divine knowing itself. This is a way of learning itself. Personally, I've always, I've never found that very persuasive. I mean, I, I understand it, and I think this is a truth to it, but to me, to make creation an exercise in self-knowledge, I think that, that never had, never was very satisfying to me. Uh, another aspect of it, I think, is that Creation is a way for the divine to share its being. So all of us, from my cosmology, all of us are sparks of light that emerge out of the primal light. So all of us are aspects of the divine, little bitty pieces broken off out of the, the primal one. And those little bitty pieces grow and grow and grow and grow. And as they grow and grow, they're actualizing their innate potential. They're actualizing their divinity. And in the end, it is as if you have a one light, which is growing billions and billions of light out of its own one light. So it's, it's sharing of its being, a cascading of the sharing of its being, which I'm sure is an inadequate model by itself. Uh, yeah, but I've asked the universe. Similarly, in, yeah. in, the, in the form of uh, the universe being this diamond with infinite facets, each facet yeah. being an individual human, you know, showing a piece of light that is part of the whole. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we always, of course, always have to remind ourselves that what has emerged up to this point in time is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's just getting started. So we have to kind of imagine ourselves a million years from now, which is nothing in evolutionary time, but a million years from now, what we might be envisioning the answer to this question to be. What is the purpose of creation? Why is, why is this happening? A million years from now, we're gonna understand it and have a much deeper answer to that question. And a million years after that, we're gonna have a deeper answer to that question. So I just, there's a certain way in which uh, I caution closure on these questions. I'd rather be agnostic somewhat, open-ended. Uh, I do think it has to do with self-knowledge, self-expression. I think it has to do with sharing nature, uh, open up opportunities for life to breed life, life to grow life. Um, yeah. no, I, more I agree than that, from we're seeing so much, particularly at the moment, we're seeing um, a lot of people fall into the trap of certitude, of, of knowing yeah. that there's some grand uh, design behind it all, whether it be, you know, yeah hidden sinister cabals, but in this time of uncertainty, yeah. people seem to be really struggling with, yeah. with that and looking for answers that, that resolve some kind of, you know, provide yeah. some kind of certitude. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, when we dissolve into the universe, when we just die and die and die and dissolve into the universe, we tap into this, so, so many of us tap into this condition where we experience the intendedness of it. We, we experience the, the meaningfulness of existence. And we walk away, come away with it saying, there is a plan, there is a purpose, there is a project here. But then when we try to describe exactly what is the plan, what is the purpose, I think we very quickly reach the limits. And and it's, the limits are simply the limits that are built into our evolutionary condition of this moment for this species in this planet, in this evolutionary period. I mean, we literally, I don't think we have a brain big enough to begin to comprehend the, the true scale. Right. Yeah. So a certain, uh, we can feel it, we can affirm it, we can assert it, but closure is... Um, right. It slips so it through our fingers. It's part of our, our nature, our, our sort of drive to, to um, find the answers and pin them down. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, rather futile. Perhaps that is what gets us into so much trouble. Yeah. Certainly one of the things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in uh, Dark Knight Early Dawn, Homo Noeticus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and the widespread use of antigens as, you know, a condition for, for the evolution of humanity. Would you talk yeah. about that a bit? Well, the concept of homo noeticus is simply a way of putting language. And, uh, and if different people have different ways of languaging, homo spiritualis, uh, the future human, the diamond soul. This is just different ways of articulating what I think is a very, very widespread collective uh, intuition, uh, perception, and that is that, that humanity is growing into something new, that there is an evolutionary development. So we go from homo habilis to homo whatnot, homo sapiens, and there's something after what we are now. There's something coming, and we generate different words for it, but the and certainly this is so strong in psychedelic experience that we are an unfinished species, that mm -hmm. we are a developmental species. And we're, and we're not just getting, we're not just getting smarter or more compassionate in incremental ways. I think there are major turning points where like the rules change when we go through these thresholds. Uh, we're coming into a bifurcation point in history. We either make it across this threshold or we probably go extinct. Uh, I personally believe that we will make it across this threshold. We will make this jump. And when we make this jump, however long it takes us, thousands of years, hundreds, whatever, however long it takes us, 
that's not going to be the end point. That's just going to be the new platform. And we will eventually reach the end of that platform. And we're going to make a jump into yet another, because that's the scale of what we're engaged in, of what we're involved in. So how do you, how do you see psychedelics as a catalyst in, in this moment? Mm. Obviously there's a huge push yeah. um, for them to be used only within the medicalized model as therapeutic yeah. tools for trauma. And then there's, you know, the proposal of modern day mystery schools, which I, I personally think yeah. is, is greatly yeah. under, um, you know, under focused. Yeah. Um, where, where do you see yeah. the psychedelics playing a role in, in this evolution? Well, I understand, uh, the, in the psychedelic community, the very strong emphasis on demonstrating the therapeutic effectiveness of psychedelics. Yeah, uh, I think it's really important that we, that we not blow this opportunity we have. We kind of blew it in the 60s. You know, it, it blew up in our faces. We lost the right to use these things. Uh, we had to go underground to use them. And it's really important that we have this new opportunity that we document things, that we demonstrate their effectiveness. And right now their effectiveness is being demonstrated in their therapeutic potential. But if we do this, if we keep going, it's only going to be a matter of time before mainstream thinkers begin to understand that the, why is it that psychedelics are so therapeutically effective? because they open up a communion with the deeper with the deeper dimensions of mind and in the early stages this encounter with the deeper dimensions of our own un, of our consciousness unconsciousness is very cleansing it's very healing it's very therapeutically efficacious can be demonstrated but if we but that's just the tip of the iceberg we go deeper, we go deeper, we go deeper. It opens up our relationship to each other. It opens up our relationship to the, to the planet, the other life forms. It opens up our relationship to spiritual reality. Personally, I was trained as a philosopher of religion. It's always been the philosophical import of psychedelics, which has interested me. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a therapist. I've always interested in the philosophical or cosmological opportunities. And I think in that perspective, we're coming to a, a critical moment in history. And it's, it's not enough just to heal us at this moment in history. We have to heal not simply the personal unconscious, though that's important. It's very important. But we have to heal the soul. We have to heal the fundamental human condition. We have, and that means recovering an understanding of what we are, who we are, where we are, what existence is about. And I think psychedelics are coming at a, you know, the re rediscovery of psychedelics in Western industrial cultures, because indigenous cultures have had them, you know, long time. But in this culture where we have lost contact with the deeper levels of our own psyche, we've lost contact with the consciousness of the earth, we've lost contact with the consciousness of the creator of galaxies psychedelics have this opportunity to awaken us quickly jar us into an awareness of this deeper dimension at exactly the time when we need it because we can't get through this period of history with the limited understanding of ourselves that have grown out of 19th century science this materialist mechanistic reductionistic understanding which is just a it's an absolutely devastating worldview to try to live in you know that you that existence comes into we come into existence by accident it's all random it has there's no meaning to it there's no meaning to our individual challenges there's no meaning to history that is a, an absolutely devastating worldview and it leads to the kind of planet that we've developed now where we just basically try to eat it all alive and get as many experiences and as much of the experience as we can possibly because when we die it's all over and it was all an exercise in futility anyway. Mm. Well, yeah. psychedelics can help us understand that that's not true. It's a very different agenda. Yeah. It's almost like they are the, the perfect tools for the human condition at this point in time. Um, they really are. And yeah, it feels like, you know, there is a, a, a grander scheme playing out. 
uh, with the Renaissance. How do you think we get psychedelics? Or what do you think is a, a good pragmatic way to get psychedelics into the field of philosophy more? Well, I think the therapists have to do their work. You know, they have to, that, that's what's really going to open the door. They have to do their work. They have to study the physiology of psychedelics. They have to demonstrate the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelics. But the mystery school aspect, the philosophical aspect, that's there. Um, I think that... Uh, the key to opening to this deeper dimension in mainstream society. If, if you're working at the fringes of society, the edges of society, we're already open to the mystery school use of psychedelics. But for mainstream culture to begin to open to this dimension of psychedelic work, I think the therapists have to lead the way uh, into it. Once we see that that's being demonstrated, then I think society will be more open to the more exotic qualities of psychedelics. But we have a lot of maturing to do there. I mean, we have so many psychedelics which unleash so many different experiences. It's an overwhelmingly complex maze. If you go from 5-MeO to uh, salvia divinorum to mm -hmm. psilocybin and Iowa, so many different experiences, it takes a huge expansion of our cosmology to understand even to begin to understand how all of these experiences can coexist within a meaningful framework of a deeper understanding of existence yeah. even just to begin that understanding we have to be highly motivated and i think the therapists are the ones that are opening that door for us yeah. i think a good way to understand it is that, that these are these are plants that have for whatever reason, evolved human neurotransmitters and the, the plants being much older than us and the evolutionary yeah. scale of things are almost trying to yeah. teach us um, yeah. a, a simpler way of being for one of a better description, yeah. but to, to yeah. look, look back through our, our you know, historical lineage and, and to perhaps examine where we went wrong. Yeah. Yeah, where we went wrong, or, or again, it's, we don't blame a first grader for being first, being six years old. You know, it's just like, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. They're just six years old, yeah. you know, and humanity, you know, we've made mistakes. We've done dumbass things. We've done this and that and the other, terrible things. But in a larger sense, uh, we're just young inexperienced, not understanding. And because we didn't all understand, we make mistakes. You know, in, in Eastern traditions, they say the core problem, the core problem is not that we're evil. The core problem is that we're ignorant. We literally don't know. And because we don't know, we make bad choices. And because we make bad choices, those have bad consequences. But the more we understand, and the more so we can make them too. Yeah. Um, I, I like the analogy. Sorry, to cut you off. I, I like the analogy of, of um, people don't judge a tree because it, it grew a little bit this way because it didn't get enough light from yeah. the other side. It just is. Yeah. It's just you know we accept yeah. it much more easily than we do with people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting times we live in. I, I want to ask, I know we're coming to sort of towards the end of the discussion. And so I want to mention something at the end. Uh, um, the last chapter of my book is called Coming Off the Mountain. And uh, I basically discuss what happened when I stopped my sessions in the years after I stopped the sessions. And I just want to mention that because I think where it's getting easier and easier with the substances that are available to us to break through consciousness, to break into intimacy with the universe, to break into transcendence, you know, to access that information. Uh, my experience was when I stopped my sessions in the years that followed, I thought that since I had been given so many gifts and since I had been, had so many mystical experiences and so many experiences of 
intimacy with the being of existence and dissolving into you know the primordial light of existence i thought that it would be easy to stop my sessions and just step away and i would be able to be nourished by those experiences mm. and what i found was that in the end uh, there was such a deep existential longing to return to those dimensions of existence and, it, and I, I knew that I had to stop for reasons I explained in the book. I had to stop this work. I came to a point where it just, I knew I needed to stop and slow things down. Um, and I knew when I stopped that I would never go back into such intimacy with the divine during my lifetime. It would only happen with death that I would return to such depth of place. And I found myself slowly entering a condition where I was just waiting to die. I was, you know, taking care of my children, teaching my classes, doing the things that I do. But in my heart of hearts, I was just waiting for this life to be over so that I could return to the full intimacy of the divine. And in time, I began to realize this, this is not right. This is not the way this work is supposed to end. And I had been so careful to integrate every session, to integrate all of my work as I went and not get ahead of myself, that I, it wasn't clear to me what, where I had gone wrong. My life was screaming failure to integrate, but it wasn't clear how I, where I had failed to integrate because I had paid so much attention to integration. And I learned that integrating a session is different than integrating an entire journey. And my journey had taken me so deeply into transcendence that I sort of lost my footing in the world of imminence. It's all the divine, the physical world is the divine, but I had entered so deeply into the transcendent divine that I had become, I, I, was, I lost my footing inside the imminent divine. And it took years, it took me about 10 years to get really grounded back in space-time reality so that I could live the remainder of my years within the joy of space-time reality. And I mention this because I think many people, as we have more experience of transcendence, we naturally want to go there uh, or let there come in here more completely. I think it's really important to address the issue of integration while we are going into these states to integrate, integrate, integrate. And integrating a journey is different than integrating individual sessions. It's a, it's a really delicate process. And so I, I mentioned my own mistakes in order to encourage other people not to make those mistakes. Right. And thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite pertinent. After this goes to air, uh, the Australian Psychedelic Society is running a, a large integration workshop. Um, yeah. And as I was saying before, with people having difficulty integrating, say, such a peak experience like 5 in the O, that embodiment, that imminence, that, that experience of the divine in, in everyday life and the, in the small things and being in nature, yeah. um, you know, eating yeah. clean and, and just looking after the presence um, rather than constantly yeah. seeking these transcendent experiences. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a beautifully pertinent uh, way yeah. to perhaps round the interview off. Um, there's a couple of quotes that really jumped out at me from the book. And I think one that fits quite well here too is you said, it's all too easy to think that because we have had a deep and profound experience, we have become deep and profound ourselves. This is a fool's delusion. I think I may not have yeah. described yeah. that, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the greatest danger, I think, of working with psychedelics is psychic inflation. And we can, we can overvalue the temporary experiences and undervalue, uh, and undervalue the stable platforms of our day-to-day -day consciousness. It's in Maslow's terms, we can overestimate the value of our peak experiences and underestimate the value of plateau experiences. Uh, so we can have a very, very profound spiritual experience on Saturday and still be an asshole on Monday, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, but well, it's it's certainly visible within you know some aspects of this like community, sadly. But yeah, we're all we're all growing, we're all learning. Yeah. So if, yeah. If, if you're if you're happy to leave it there, Chris, thank you so very very much on on behalf of the Australian Psychedelic Society and and everyone that's viewing this. Uh, thank you for your time. Pleasure to have the conversation. Thank you. For your Good to have this conversation. Yeah, I recommend everybody read. Uh, read the, your latest book um, and thank you very much let us know where where readers can uh, people can get hold of uh, the book I well I've just been bit. told that uh, Amazon isn't delivering to Australia now so uh, probably the easiest way is through digital forms Amazon will you know deliver digital forms um, okay. I I'm very late in getting my website up I don't it isn't finished yet so it'll it'll be there within a, a couple of months, I hope. Um, so easiest way to get it is through inner traditions or through Amazon or other booksellers and, to, and get it digitally. If it's not being mailed in a hard copy. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and stay safe in these strange and interesting times. Um, stay safe. Thank you for your work. Uh, one day I hope maybe I'll be able to get to Australia and meet you fantastic. in person. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah, look forward yeah. to having conversations with your larger psychedelic society. It'd be a pleasure. Absolutely, yeah. And, and we'd yeah. love to have you speak at, at, at you know, one of the larger conferences here. If, if you uh, feel so inclined and have the ability to come out. It'd be great. Love It'd be great. great. Thank you, Chris. All the best.